Today, I'm going to talk to you about the rules of etiquette or behavior that every disc golfer should know in order not to be a jerk on the course. And now I know some of you will want me to get straight to the list, so I will give you a quick rundown at the front and then leave chapter links in the description so you can skip to only the parts you want to hear me explain each rule more in depth. More in depthly? More in depth. Okay. For the rest of you who can stand to listen to my voice and look on my handsome face a little bit more, I will set the stage for why rules matter. But first, the obligatory quick intro. Okay, here you go, down and dirty. The front nine rules will focus primarily on individual play. One, you represent disc golf. Two, understand the basics of the rules. Three, let faster players through. Four, do not throw if it's unsafe. Five, obey the park rules. Six, look after the course. Seven, attempt to return all discs. Eight, don't jump in front of others. And nine, don't be a disruption. Okay, the back nine will focus on group play. One, be a good time steward. Two, limit groups to five or less. Three, don't be a distraction. Four, respect honors and furthest out. Five, ask before giving advice. Six, clear the basket. Seven, watch other players throw. Eight, help search for discs. And nine, care more about others than yourself. Now, if you want to know more about each one of these and why these rules are important, feel free to stick around. If you have to go, Heiser bomb the subscription button on your way out to help this old goat. I'm almost at a thousand subscriptions and it'd be a fun milestone to reach in this video. Okay, why rules? Now with the boom in disc golf, we are finding ourselves with a wonderful problem. So many new players are falling in love with the game, but so many of them haven't had anyone help them understand the rules of the course. So I'm putting this video together to help new players understand how we can all work together to make our courses great places to play and interact. Course etiquette makes it a better experience for everyone, and that is the goal to have fun and enjoy being outdoors playing this amazing sport with as little drama as possible. Now these are not the official rules of golf as laid out by the PDGA, which we will touch on just a bit, but rather the rules of behavior as a disc golfer and a human being. So when you step on a tee pad, you will need to give up a little bit of you do you in order to experience a better we do we. Now a big shout out to Disc Golf Down Under for his video on this very same subject. I looked at some of his points and added my own twist and thoughts, but sadly I couldn't steal his amazing accent. Boy, that was horrible. I'm sorry. God. I tried. I tried. I said don't do it and I did it anyway. Dang it. If you haven't checked out his phenomenal channel, check the link in the description. Like and subscribe to him and give that man some Disc Golf love. Boy, that sounded... That sounded wrong. Let me go back and try that again. Like and subscribe and give this man some disc golf love. Okay, now on to the 18 rules. The front nine will be about the individual player and the back nine will focus on playing as a group. So let's jump in. One. You represent disc golf. You are an ambassador of the game, and every time you step on a donated piece of property, park, or private facility, you have to be aware of that. Be good stewards of the course, and let your attitude and character invite others to enjoy the game. Also understand that your actions can ruin the game for others, and keep in mind that courses have been closed down due to the bad action of only a few players. However, on a positive note, you could be the person that introduces or inspires the future Paul Macbeth, Gannon Burr, or whoever is your favorite player. They could be coming from your course. So show people the good side of disc golf. Two. 
understand the basics of the rules, go to pdga.com and understand the basics of the game so that you cannot be a hindrance, but rather help to others. You don't have to learn all the minutia of the rules, but when we learn the rules so that we can play together on an agreed upon manner, it allows us to have a more harmonious game, hard to say, and it also helps us not kill each other. Cause that certainly was a foot fault and you are now dead to me. Never happened really. I know a couple people maybe. Three. Let faster players through. This is just being a good human. Pay attention and regularly look behind you. Don't make others sit behind you hole after hole. You are not alone out there. Now I have read different discussions about this and maybe I'm just old or have a different personality, but I'm amazed at how many folks will say online, screw them, make them wait. It's going to slow me down. And if I let them through, I'm going to have to wait. I got here first. Now, unfortunately, I'm seeing this attitude more and more on the course as well. And my hope that this is due to a lack of knowing how it should work versus just being selfish. It is a rule to promote faster play for all and reduce stress and drama on the course. Let's face it, it's not a pleasant experience being behind a slower group. And it also adds stress to the group in front because you slowly get the feeling that the folks behind you are not happy with you. Be willing to give a little and it will be a better round for everyone. Also, you won't gain the reputation of being a course hog and have a large group of potential friends and players not want to play with you. Now, of course, there are gray areas, such as you're only one hole away from 18, or you were just playing slow, but you can play faster. Whenever you're in a tough call situation like that, don't just pretend the group behind you is not there. Simply turn around, communicate with them, and let them know that you see them and that you can speed up and if you don't, on the next two holes, you will let them pass. Just letting them know that you are valuing their time as well as your own will help diffuse a lot of tension. But making eye contact and acknowledging other people not in your group is becoming a foreign concept. We've got to do better. We are no longer isolated at home during COVID and we need to work on being social. You need to communicate and talk to others. Look up and say hey. Four. Don't throw if it's unsafe. You need to walk up to blind corners and make sure it's clear. Know who is ahead of you and then holler clear to any groups behind you when you finish a hole or move down the fairway a safe distance away from the tee box. Be especially careful around pedestrians and non-disc golfers who don't know what to look for. Don't throw over them or their property that could get damaged. Just don't risk it. Parks have closed courses after people have been hurt, and we don't want that. Also, unfortunately, there are a few folks out there who are looking for an excuse to cause problems. I'm pretty sure this one guy walks his dog off the walking path, head first into a blind curve of hole number one, just in case he gets hit. That way he will be able to petition the parks department to close the course so he can enjoy the park without disc golf. So please don't give folks ammunition to fight our sport. Five. Obey park rules. Same thing. We're playing at the mercy of parks, so don't blow it for others. I'm not going to discuss the whole alcohol or other substances issue other than to say, please refer to rule number one and ask if your actions are putting the course at risk. Be smart about how you handle yourself and your substances. Also, anytime you can help the park guys out on the course, please do it as it will help us develop goodwill and you will be investing in the sport for others. We want to be known by the parks as assets to the park rather than problems that they have to deal with. Six. Look after the course. Number one thing, litter. If you bring it in, you need to take it out. And yes, I understand sometimes we drop or forget something on the course and it happens, but that's not what I'm talking about. The amount of cans and bottles that are placed and hidden around the course shows that people are taking time and effort to get rid of their trash and they don't care about how it affects other people. 
they just don't want to have to deal with it or carry it themselves. Do I really need to express how selfish and poor showing of character that is? Come on guys, we can do better. Leave the course better than you found it. This was drilled into us as early players of the game. Parks began to want us to come put courses in because they knew trash and litter problems were going to disappear because we would pick up as we went. Our bags used to have as much trash in them as discs. First of all, we didn't have that many discs, but we had a lot of trash. And we picked up trash along the way. This is a way to serve your course by cleaning it up every time you go out. Second thing, and you need to listen up, do no damage on the course. This is actually a PDGA written rule and can get you kicked from tournaments, banned from playing on courses, or even greater sanctions depending on the severity of what you do. This includes damaging signs, baskets, tee pads, and especially pulling down or trimming live limbs, trees, and bushes that may be a nuisance or in your way for a shot. So unless you have permission from the stewards of the course, it is not your job to reshape the holes. And it is a very quick way to anger an entire group of your fellow players. Graffiti is also a Bobo no-no. Seven! Attempt to return all discs. Put your info on it so people can find you. And if you find one, do your best to contact the owner. Or drop it in the lost and found on Facebook or drop it at your local shop. I know the joy of finding a sweet disc in the woods with no ink on it, but do me a favor, try to get it back to the owner. You will make someone's day if you track them down. Now if you have tried for a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of effort and you can't find them, then you can throw the disc guilt free. On the flip side, if someone finds your disc because you've put your info on it and they contact you or post it on Facebook, do not make it a hassle for them. You go to them and get the disc. Don't make them come to you. And also, tip them for their troubles. They did what an unfortunately large segment of our disc golfing community doesn't, and that should be rewarded. Here's a side note too. Almost all the discs that have been returned to me in the past couple years have been by folks that I had at one time or another found their disc and returned it to them. So being others focused is harder than being selfish, but is the very thing that's going to build a better disc golf community. You can do it. I know you can. Hey. Don't jump in front of others. Folks playing the holes in order have a right of way. Cutting in front of a group can mess up their rhythm and is considered a jerk move. For instance, Inverness Hole 6 is a great alternate starting hole right by parking, but often you can't see the guys just coming down hole number five. So they end up getting stuck behind you as you have just cut the line. If this should happen, it is your responsibility to simply apologize and let them play through. Being nice and social at that time is great because it may be that in a few holes you tend to be playing faster, they may let you back through or even better, they may ask you to join them for the rest of the round. And you may end up becoming friends with them, or at least you've had a friendly experience. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Ignore that. Nine. Don't be a disruption. Noise volume should not be disturbing to your group and especially others on the course. And that also goes for what kind of lyrics you're playing out of your speakers. Really understand and pay attention to the noise impact you have on the course. Okay, now I may step on some toes here, but here we go. Kids and dogs. They are both welcome and encouraged on most courses. But remember, you are not alone out there. You love your dogs and your kids. <laughs> but that doesn't mean everyone else does. And some folks have an issue with either or both of them while playing. So you need to be aware of that. You are responsible for their movement, noise, free roaming, and of course their crap both dogs and kids. <laughs> How your dogs and kids behave on the course will have an impact on who will want to play with you and any damage to the course or people by either can have serious and possible long-lasting effects. One. Be a good time steward. 
This means that you are aware of how you are impacting the flow and speed of the game for the rest of the field. Don't waste time and delay the game, but also don't rush others. Delaying the game is more than just going over the PDGA rule of 30 seconds for each throw. It's also not paying attention when it's your turn or being ready to throw. So you're just standing around telling a joke or standing in the fairway not doing anything while a group is waiting behind you on the tee. It is you taking up more time than is necessary to make the shots and have an enjoyable round with the others. Now most of the time we shouldn't be that uptight about the time when we're playing a casual round with friends, but you should pay attention to the speed and flow of the group and try to match it. Especially if there are others on the course, you need to be aware of whether you're blocking other folks. Working on this in a low stress round when it's casual is great practice for when you play leagues and tournaments so you can get your timing down so you won't have to think about it when it's under stress. Side note, if you watch any of the disc golf coverage online, think about how hard it is to watch some of these top pros take so long to putt. It really is painful and feels like death watching them rock back and forth for what seems like hours. Now fortunately, they make a lot of them so you think, Oh, I'll let that one slide. They obviously have a system and it's looking like it's working for them. And actually we start to see more and more people trying to copy them. And I don't think that's necessarily a great idea. Now I'm not a sports psychologist, but I think all those twitches and back and forth are not necessarily helping the nerves or getting a better putting stroke, but that's just me. Now think about the folks in your group having to watch you as you take 20 or 30 practice swings to make a 15 foot putt during a $5 fun round. Give them a break and learn how to cut down your pre-throw twitches and nervous routine so that you're not killing everyone around you. But now there is a flip side to this, and some of you may struggle with this like I do. And that's where you want to go faster and faster. You just want to get up and throw and go. And this is fine for a running round or when you're playing with a couple of your buddies who have gotten used to your neurotic fast play. But others are going to find this style irritating. So don't stress out and push your group. You need to read the others and understand their timing and adjust your game accordingly. This is your chance to serve others by slowing down. And that's what you need to understand. Your timing can affect the rest of the group and the rest of the field. Two. Limit groups to five or less. And this is a standard rule for both ball golf and disc golf. And a lot of folks are going to be hesitant to ask to cut through a group, so it's going to be up to you, even if it's less than five, for you to be aware that you may be blocking other people. Kind of goes with the timing up above. Is You need to be aware, and you might even want to have one of your guys that's more observant and more social be the one that's keeping track of anybody behind them and be ready to invite them to play through. It's just a nice way to facilitate and serve others and not block them and be jerks on the course. But Pete, you mean I can't play with a bigger group? Sometimes those are a lot of fun. And I agree. So what you're going to have to do is either break them up into two smaller groups and just rotate around maybe, or you're going to have to play on the course when it's a real low traffic time so you won't bother other players. Different courses will have empty periods when the course is wide open and a large group won't interfere with other people trying to play through. But remember, that is the exception and not the rule, and it's up to you to not be the group that is hogging the course. Now, Pete, what about doubles? And you've got three sets of two playing together and you, you can't split it up and leave one double on its own. I know, I agree, totally. But then it's up to you to make sure you either A, playing fast enough that you're not blocking people or you're letting everybody through. And to be honest, most double playing that I see, people get really uptight and really work on their putts and they tend to be some of the slowest people out there. So you need to be aware that you could be the problem if you've got more than five. I tend to try to limit it to four or less, but know that five is usually the maximum that you want to have on a card. Three. Don't be a distraction. Your number one role in a group setting is to not be a jerk. That means respecting other players' wishes and don't distract others when they're throwing. This includes making noise and movement, especially when folks are putting. You need to go online and watch how the pros interact, especially around the basket. And when in doubt, freeze. 
even if you get caught in the putter's eye line, your freezing will let them know that you see them and then they can decide if they need to ask you to move. Don't give your card mates a reason to blame you for a bad shot. Not that we would ever blame anyone else but ourselves for missing a putt. Four. Respect honors and furthest out. Honor good scoring by having the best scores from the previous hole go first on the tee pad. Ties will be resolved by the earlier scores than that on the hole previous. Furthest from the basket will then dictate how to throw all the rest of the shots from that point on. There are some caveats. If there's a situation where speed of play is involved and you can go faster by throwing out of turn or there's a safety issue, then you can adjust that. This is a great way to reinforce respect and flow while playing in a group. Now when you're playing with your buddies and you're just having a good time, all bets are off. And to be honest, I may or may not have gotten into a wrestling match trying to steal the box from my buddy John, but that's a completely different type of disc respect. See what I did there? Five. Ask before giving advice. You may know more than the other person, but until you know that person, their history and their openness to coaching, it may rub them the wrong way, even if your intentions are there to help. You never know if that person is working on something, having a bad day, or there's something physical that's hindering them. So unsolicited advice could be taken the wrong way. I once had a guy walk up to me that I'd never met before. And within five minutes, he volunteered to give me lessons, me paying of course, to help improve my game. Now there were a couple problems. One, he never asked me a single question about my game, my experience, or if I was interested in receiving coaching. And number two, I was throwing better than him, and I had 25 years more experience in the game than he did, and I was personally content with where my game was, and I wasn't ready to spend money to have somebody coach me at that time. So it really just came off as a jerk move because what I felt was that he was more interested in telling me what he knew instead of finding out what I may have needed. The number one goal of a good teacher is to help facilitate what students need and that most almost always starts with questions. Six. Clear the basket. This is a quick one. Any disc that's in the chains or the basket can deflect the next disc right out of the basket. So don't be the cause of someone losing a stroke. Your disc goes in, quickly move there, remove the disc, get it out of the way, and let them make their shot. Seven. Watch other players' throws. Now, should I have an apostrophe? Players should be possessive? I don't, I don't know. Anyway, watch the other people playing. Watch the other people throwing. There are two reasons. One, it's your duty, and two, you may learn something. When playing with a group, you are responsible to help decide if and where a disc goes out of bounds, misses a mando, or other things. Therefore, you need to be paying attention to each throw to be able to give helpful, accurate input. You are not playing by yourself, and so that adds an extra layer of responsibility and interaction to your game. You may also learn new form, new shots, flight lines, and local routes, and maybe even a better understanding of the rules. So we need to be lifetime learners, and one of the best ways we can do that is to watch the other players around us. Eight. Help search for lost discs. It's a rule and it simply builds community. You are required to help anyone in your group look for their discs per the PDGA rules. But more importantly, it's just the right thing to do. By looking for a lost disc, you are saying to the other person, you and your discs are important and I'm not gonna be selfish and make you look for this alone. Now there is a time limit to how long you will look for a disc, but you can never go wrong offering to help anyone look for their discs, especially when you have experienced another player stopping their game and going out of the way to help you find one of your favorite discs. That is what helps build a great disc golf community because it reinforces that we are all working together on this amazing, maddening game and we won't leave a man or a disc behind. Nine. Care more about others and not about yourself. It is not all about you. 
don't only talk about your game or your shots or even just consistently talk about disc golf. Stop and ask people in your group how they're doing and do something crazy. Listen to their responses. I truly understand the desire to let others know that you belong on the course and that you're worthy of respect because you've got disc golf game. The problem is we're insecure and we tend to overdo it by talking ourselves up and downplaying our mistakes. But the problem is everyone else is also wrapped up in their own thoughts and nobody's listening. So what if you are different and you reach out to those that have been put into your group and find out about them as human beings? Make who they are more important than the level of disc golf they can play. I have been able to have some of the most amazing conversations and get to know some incredible folks just by asking someone in my group, how are you doing? Really? Let's be more than just disc golfers. Let's be good humans. Now, unfortunately, you're going to run into some folks that really just give a crap about any of this, and they can make it pretty miserable for everyone. Please don't be one of those people. I have said it before. We only have a short time here on Earth, and our relationships and our character are things we're going to care more about than our scores when things grow to an end. I'm striving to help you become a better disc golfer, but I'm even more passionate about you becoming a better person. Let's face it, having a thousand rating and yet no one wants to play with you is not a win in my book. But then again, what do I know? I'm just an old goat who made disc golf way too important for too many years. And now I'm struggling to make it simply a tool for enjoyment, encouragement, and helping others. I will also let you in on one last secret before I close. It is really freeing when I don't need disc golf to be the foundation of my self-worth. I am known and loved by my father and my family, and that allows me not to give in to the constant need to brag about my great games or make excuses for my bad ones in the hope that I can prove that I'm worthy of acceptance. But I'm not finished yet. You see, I notice a trend on how quickly I can fall back into needing a good round of disc golf to make me feel good about myself when other parts of my life aren't working out too well. You see, I've made sports, and especially disc golf, an idol in my life for too long. And you see, we look to sports for a lot of things, and I think sports are great, and disc golf is one of the greatest, but it makes a terrible God. So please, love the game, but love yourself and others more. So there you go. That's all I got. I hope this helps. I hope the rules make sense. And I hope to see you out on the course.